watching some of the best 3D modelers design in SOLIDWORKS and it's live on YouTube and you can ask questions about what's going on and the people sharing their screens are from all over the globe. Well, if you've never heard of our live design live streaming series on the SOLIDWORKS YouTube channel, I just gave you my best synopsis possible. So welcome to this special edition of SOLIDWORKS Live. So as far as live design goes, while it is absolutely best in my humble opinion to tune in to our live design episodes live, we understand here at SOLIDWORKS that it's usual airtime scheduled Fridays, by the way, at 12 p.m. Eastern. That might not always be doable. After all, right, some of us have to work in SOLIDWORKS, of course, to make the products that we use every day or you're maybe getting some much needed sleep wherever you are in the world. So just a tad past the halfway point here in 2023, we had the idea on the live stream team here to save you a bit of time. So we've produced down some of the most viewed moments of five of our most watched episodes of live design so far here in 2023. So you can watch each of these episodes in full, by the way, on SOLIDWORKS YouTube today, but for now, let's enjoy the best of the best. So to kick us off, let's talk SOLIDWORKS certification. Mark Peterson and Jesse Sprague, both certified SOLIDWORKS experts, logged on not too long ago to the SOLIDWORKS live design stage to share their screens as they moved through practice certification exams and shared with some Q&A some of their SOLIDWORKS tips and tricks in getting those certifications added to their portfolios. So let's take a glimpse at this live design episode on SOLIDWORKS certifications. Okay, so now we need to generate this part. And this is the isometric view I was talking about before. So I'm gonna you know, keep an eye on this. That'll sort of be my home base to make sure that I can compare my document with what's here. Um, and you know, I know that you know, if this is the isometric view, then this kind of left leaning face, that's gonna be my front view or my front plane. So this is very simply a sketch that I'm going to sketch on the front plane. You, you can choose whatever plane you want, but this is just what I think about when I'm kind of go, trying to create a strategy around creating these parts, because it looks very complicated, especially if you're relatively new to, to uh, 3D modeling and CAD. Um, and so for me, it's just easy to take these steps and break it down step by step. And so I have a, a, a procedure that I follow. Um, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of uh, dimensions but it's actually a lot more simple than it looks, okay? So for example, we have uh, like, let's say this icon here. This is just pointing out that there's tangency between this straight line and this curved line, for example. So that's a relation that we wanna make between these two lines um, uh, before we, you know, uh, it's just information for us there. We also have A, B, and C, like I showed before. So these are elements that, you know, we're gonna have to type in a number there and it's a variable. Um, so we're gonna talk about global variables in a moment. You also have um, other things here that I'll probably leave out of the sketch. For example, this hole. And, you know, this is maybe a little contentious. I don't know. I, I usually like to create holes as separate features as extruded cuts. Some people like to just put the hole there in their sketch and extrude without the material. I don't re I don't recommend doing that. But again, this is your, your exam. You do whatever you think is best. But I usually leave things like this out. Helps me simplify it a little bit more. We also have these uh, bits of material removed off the corner. I think of these as just chamfers. You can see them in the isometric view. So I might want to set, save those as like an applied feature rather than getting all confused about, you know, setting an angle and doing all this sort of stuff. It's a lot more time and effort to sketch these than it is to just apply them as a uh, applied chamfer. Yeah, so that's really, a great when, point too. It's kind yeah. of, you know, Mark, you and I have done a bunch of, uh, of training and <clears throat> that's like one of those first steps that you get to is taking a look at a piece of geometry and breaking it down into what features am I going to use where, right? That mental step is always really valuable, extra valuable when you're taking an exam, right? Because you're under the time crunch, right? And Matt Clegg was just saying in the, in the chat a bit ago that time management is usually one of the things that gets people. Uh, it's not so much that you don't know the skills, it's just can you get them all <laughs> implemented yeah. in the amount of time that you have. Um, so taking the time to do this is often thing something that people will skip. They just dive right in and say, "Oh shoot, I, I you know I'm under the I'm under the time crunch. I'm just gonna go as fast as I can." But to take the time and think this through will almost always save you a bunch of time in the long run um, because you've you've thought through the process of what you're gonna do and where you're going going to apply things. Exactly. And something else is gonna help out with that time is some of the other tips I was suggesting earlier about things like keyboard shortcuts and that sort of thing. 
um, and just being efficient about your mouse movements. So I want to start sketching, for example, on the front plane. So I could go to sketch and then select the front plane, you know, over here. Um, but to me, it's easier if I just select the front plane and use this context sensitive pop-up window. I'll yeah, and Mark, speaking of shortcuts, you taught me the Q key a while ago, which I've been using nonstop. So oh, yeah. good tip for uh, showing and hiding your planes quickly. That's uh, that's a that's a great tip. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you just use Q, that just brings up all your planes. So then you can just yeah. select here, sketch right there. That's a great tip. There you go. So you'll see that the screen rotated. We're now normal to that that plane, and we're ready to get started. So with this sketch, um, you know, I'm just going to start at this bottom left hand corner and just kind of go around, trying to create these um, bits of geometry. I'll start like at, you know simple and then just kind of get more you know more complex as we go but i just want to try to get something on the page uh close to but not exactly what's shown so i just want the general shape so i'll start on the origin i always like to start there just to get that um that coincident relationship and you'll notice with my cursor that you know sometimes you're getting like these little yellow boxes next to the pencil that's just telling you that it's going to create a relation automatically so if i click now it's going to create a vertical line for me so these are really helpful shortcuts um, whenever you need to create vertical or horizontal lines. If I come out here straight to the right, you know, I'm going to get a horizontal line there. If I want to angle a line down, that's great. I can do that. Now I need a curved section here. A really great shortcut for this is just to move your cursor back to this endpoint of this line and come out. And now you have this, uh, this little curved line there, just like that. If you want to get back to a straight line, you can hit the A key. That will get you back to a curved line or a straight line. You can actually use the A key to alternate again to that uh, curved line. So just a couple little tips there. Click there. We're going to come out to the right a little bit horizontally, down vertically a little bit. Another angled line here, another horizontal line here. Uh, this one, I can't do that little trick because it's not tangency here. So I'm just going to do, let's just say, a basic straight line. I can do tangency here. So I'm going to come back, get a little curved line there. And then I'm just going to finish that up by clicking at the origin. Okay, so now I've created a closed profile. We can see that. Um, it looks something similar to this, but there is certainly some cleanup that I have to do. I think I did a good job with those inferenced relations, um, but you know, there's still some things I wasn't able to do quite well. And so I want to start by making sure I have all my relations first. Then I'm going to do all my dimensions. And my goal is to fully define this sketch using the information shown on the screen. So if I select, for example, this line here, I want that to be horizontal. So I'll use the context sensitive uh, pop-up window here and specify that I want that horizontal, for example. I want this and this to be uh, tangent. And so I can actually select the point in between the line and the arc and say make tangent. Uh, the other way you would do that is you would select the line control on your keyboard, then select this arc, then you can make that tangent that way. This is the line that really wasn't supposed to be there. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of that using delete. And now what I want to do is use a three point arc to create this arced segment here. But instead of going all the way up to my sketch toolbar and selecting three point arc here, I'm just going to use the S key on my keyboard. Um, and that brings up my commands that I can quickly access here. Now, these are the default commands that are on there. Um, and you can do three point arc straight from here, but you can also search any commands or tools right there if you want. So here's my three point arc. So I'm just going to select one point, the other point, and then just some sort of midpoint there. Okay, hit escape to get out of that. And we're looking pretty good. Now, this is just a general layout of what this should look like. I need to apply dimensions in order to fully define this. And fully defining is very important. If your sketch isn't fully defined, it's likely that you will probably get the question wrong. So all the information you need is going to be here. So just make sure you use all that information and use it in the way that you're doing here. With dimensioning, I usually like to start with the larger dimensions first and move to smaller ones. So the largest dimension here is going to be A, then B. So I need to know what A and B are. So there's A and B, 81 and 57. So time to use the Smart Dimension tool to start defining my sketch. So I could, again, go all the way up to my Command Manager toolbar and use Smart Dimension here. Uh, or I could use the S key. There's Smart Dimension on that one. Or if you want to, you can play around with the uh, 
Uh, yeah, we just called? got a comment from Mouse Gestures right in oh, the yeah. chat there. Yeah, Mouse Gesture Wheel. Yeah, I, I yep. forgot what it was called for a second. <laughs> so if you click and hold your right mouse button and kind of wiggle it around, you have um, by default these four quadrants that you can just swipe through. So if I swipe through this top quadrant, my cursor is now a uh, Smart Dimension tool. If I do that again, it turns it off. So that's a very fast way of getting to that Smart Dimension tool if you, you want to try to use that. That can be configured to eight or I think even 16, which is a, probably a bit overboard, but eight is probably a good sweet spot. So we need to uh, dimension these. So for, for dimension A, I'm going to select these two lines, drop this down, and click here. Now, there's a reason why I put the dimension down here, and it's often overlooked, but it's something that you, you will do over time as you complete these exams because you recognize how powerful and useful this is. What I'm doing here is I'm just trying my best to make sure that my screen looks ex as close as possible to what's been given to me. And so what I'm going to do is try to place these dimensions in the same exact place. That way, if I don't feel confident about my answer, I can always look back and just double check and just go left and right. Kind of, uh, what, what was it? You were in the doctor's office and they had like the little book where you had to like see what was wrong on yep. one side, what was on one side wasn't what, yep. what was on the other. Something one of like these that. things is not like the other kind of thing. Yeah. So as we just saw, passing certifications, that whole topic, it has its own tips and tricks associated with it. You know, how do you manage your time? How do you effectively practice? However, another area of SOLIDWORKS that certainly has its own tips and tricks associated with it is working with imported geometry directly inside of SOLIDWORKS. So recently, Barry Setzer of Titans of CNC shared the live design stage with Brian Zayas in showing some of his favorite tried and true moments of editing aerospace geometry inside SOLIDWORKS 3D CAD. Whether or not you've worked in aerospace or worked with imported geometry even before, I'm totally confident that you'll learn something new and valuable from this next clip featuring two absolute SOLIDWORKS whizzes. Let's take a look. Dumb solids, right? Just, just what kind of direct editing tools we can use to take whatever format we're getting you know, someone sends us a step file, someone sends us a share and markup, you know, and downloads the step file. Uh, what can we do? And I know there's so much modification that happens between the design model and fabrication. And that's a whole other topic. I got tons of questions that I want to understand about how we can close that loop with mutual understanding. But I guess that's what you're all going to get out of today's episode is a real good triangulation of uh, SOLIDWORKS tips from an expert with uh, a lot of good perspective from manufacturing which I guess really informs then what your CAD should look like, right? In terms of precision, quality, and robustness. So enough yabber, yabbering, uh, Barry, do you want to bring up the model you were just showing me? That would be a great place to start. Sure. Oh, this is great, man. And he, he, by the way, big thanks to Barry for downsizing his jumbo wide 4K and his beautiful workspace there <laughs> down, at, down at Titans. But uh, so this is an aerospace component and maybe I'll let you share a little bit more of the background and maybe what's the girth of this thing? It looks very slender and difficult. Yeah. So it's, it's roughly 12 feet long and maybe eight inches wide here at the widest point. Um, this was, eight inch. Yep. Yeah. This was probably the most difficult part I ever had the model in my career. Uh, took me several months to finish it and it may not look like much from here, but once you understand a little bit about aircraft drawings, you know, all of these surfaces are lofted, they're all tapered, nothing's flat, you know, it's got all these different tilted walls and fillets everywhere and just, it was just a nightmare and it was a hand-drawn drawing that was just... Well, let me say to everyone out there, like, Barry showed me under the hood already, there is a whole surface modeling master class in terms of legacy drawing what TIFF files or whatever, um, scanning them. I mean, you said you hunted out 20 drawings. You're creating line art surface extrudes off sketch pictures. I feel like that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> but if we, I don't know if we have time. If you guys want to see that, let us know in the chat. Do you want us to get, to get back into drawings, modeling this from legacy? Because I've also loved where you were starting here, which is hot mess. I mean, there's not even a material on this thing. It's a, it's a dumb solid if I can say that, because I don't know, is a step file? Like this, yeah. but this is typical of what you get and what I'm sure we all end up starting with, right? A dumb solid one way or another. You look at the part like this and you can't, you know, feature recognition is great, but on something like this, you just can't do it because there's so much going on. 
I mean, so many lofted surfaces, so many crazy fillets. I mean, I showed you the actual tree yesterday where I think it had, we, I was on like fillet number 270. I thought it was 400. I mean, it was, guys, again, it's a master class. It, it, it was brutal. But, uh, you know, when you get a part like this in machining, a lot of times, you know, you'll get a model and say that this is a Rev F model. But then there'll be like, you know, seven EOs after it that are changing things. But this Rev F model doesn't have that. So as the machinist, I have to look at those EOs and I have to modify the features that are, are required for the finished part because it won't match this model. Oh, man. So you end up having to put all the uh, input together and basically be the final CAD yep. designer. Yep. And again, this is something I want to come back to. If we have time, it's like, then do you, how do we get that back in engineering hands, right? Like there's so much modification that happens during fabrication, installation. Like, yeah, and it's did, funny. You know, a lot of certain... times you, you'll model a part like this for, you know, a third uh, third party. And you'll ask them like, hey, do you want me to send you the model so you could share it with your customer? And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, we'll yeah. never use it. Oh, yeah. Like, okay. Oh. Some of the things that will make you faster, things like uh, understanding what certain errors mean and what's causing them, uh, how to fix them. And how to take some shortcuts that, you know, even if even even if a shortcut only saves you, say, five seconds a day, over 20 years, that adds up. So, you know, it's, sometimes it's the little things and sometimes it's basic things. You know, we talked a little bit yesterday about how there were times where I was doing things like the dumbest way imaginable for years <laughs> until I saw somebody do something. And I was like, wait, how did you just do that? So, you know, there's going to be things in uh, our live today that will appear more appeal more to beginners some of it will appeal more to experts but i kind of wanted to cover a, a full gamut so that we had something for everybody since you brought it up you know we'll, we'll start with something super simple um you know if you look at all of the tabs that we have in solidworks there's a lot of stuff in there but what sometimes you might not realize is there's even more that's not shown up here so you know for me i know the tools that i use on a very basic awesome basis. tab yeah, so like I've created Barry's awesome. Okay, no, pause here. I mean, this is the one. Oh, yeah, delete body, delete key body, delete face. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I really like the, the SolidWorks user interface for these uh, tabs and toolbars. Like if I wanted to throw something else on there, I just go to tools, customize if I could get down there. And then just go to commands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that you can search for a command. So if you already know what the command is, you can just type it in there and find it. Like if I'm looking for measure, say, I want to put measure. On oh, my... man. Well, you know what you can do now. Are you in 2023, by the way? Or what What you, What you? version? Um, oh, S, key, com S key command search, by the way. Uh, short, you bring up the shortcut bar and the command oh, search yeah. is right there, 2023. Yep. But you know, you if can... you're not using 2023, you can just find the command you want and just drag it up to your toolbar done oh, deal okay. let's just say that they come and tell you that they want a um additional rib and let's just say let's say they want to go three inches off of this face and put another rib here that goes from this wall to the, to the wall next to it okay now, whoops Give me your mouse. i imagine that's got to be uh tapered or drafted yes. i guess is yep. that the right way to say that Yep, they're drafted and they're also tapered outward. So you can't just draw a rectangle on the floor and, and boss that up. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of things that you can kind of do to cheat it. But mm -hmm. in this case, I wanted to show two methods that I use when I have to do something like this, especially on contoured parts or, you know, parts where I don't have edges that I can convert. So the first way uh, we're going to do is we're going to, Go ahead and put a, a plane in. And okay. We'll three inches off of that face. Is that going to be the mid plane? No, nah, I'm going to use this as one of the outside planes. All right. We're going to create a loft here. But uh, to get the geometry of these walls and floors, to get actual edges that I can use here, the first tool I'm going to use is split line. So we're going to use this plane. Oh, interesting. And then we're going to select the faces that we want to. Oh, dude, I haven't used this in years. I mean, with simulation, you this was like a, a godsend to get this because you could you know split where you want to apply a force. So yeah, yep. show that one more time. That sure. That is one of those tools we were just talking about. If you 
are just learning that now. You you know, again, tell me that years ago when I started. <laughs> so, yeah, and split line, I think, is part of the mold tools. Uh, oh, man. Toolbox. But again, I have it out here on my Barry's Awesome tab. So all you got to do is click, you know, we created our plane. We're going to pick split line, mm -hmm. intersection. Mm hmm. And all of these things are useful. You just got to play with it to know what each one. So does. you're not you're not making a sketch or trying to do some three D sketch or multiple planar sketches and convert entities. This is it just it just slices all those faces with this plane. Yep. And you could probably do surface bodies if you want to do some kind of curvilinear inter intersect. Yeah, yeah, we could. And, and then I kind of wow, just wanted man. to show that's great this so that we can see how we can get those edges at the exact plane mm -hmm. where we need them. And now that we have those edges, we can do just a plain sketch on that same plane. We can convert those edges. Nah, you can do that. Whoops, not that face. Yep. That's brilliant. Yep. And then we just draw our line across the top. Boom. Now, that's one section of our loft. For the second one, we're going to do it a little bit different way. But I like this way because I've used it for a whole lot of different things. And a couple of the other guys here have also found it useful. So now, now we're going to create another plane, eighth of an inch off of that one. And now, rather than using split line, and you know, sometimes you may not want to use split line because you want to be, this to be a continuous surface when we get into machining for our CAM software. So what we're going to do this time is we're going to select that new plane and we're going to do cut with surface and we're going to cut our part yeah. off that plane. Now we still want the stuff that we cut away, but now we want these edges here. So what we're going to do is on that plane that we use to cut, we're going to sketch. We're going to do just like we did with split line. Draw our little top line here. Mm -hmm. Dude, you are stealing edges. This is great. Yep. And I like to call this a ghost sketch. A ghost oh. sketch. Okay. I was going to say, yep. what do you call this? This is, this is. Yeah. So, so right now, if I were to close out of this sketch and delete that surface cut, my, my sketch will have rebuild errors in it because it's tied yeah. to these edges that are no longer going to exist. And that's something that, you know, Going from like Katia to SolidWorks, you know, SolidWorks' tree is chronological, and I love that about it because, you know, what you did here, yes, you know, can't exist until what you did before. Oh, my mouse is going crazy. <laughs> F, okay. zoom to fit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, so in Katia, what would what would be different about that? Uh, the references, the edge edge references? Yeah, I mean, back, back when I was using it, I'm not sure what it's like today, but it had, you know, like a, a separate tree for curves and you know, separate tree for surfaces. And it was just really different to me because I'd used SolidWorks for years before I got into Katia. And, you know, I, my, my bread and butter has always been SolidWorks. I've always been a little bit better with it, but, uh, you know, with this, with this sketch here, um, so that we don't end up getting that rebuild there, we're going to just right click off in space and say display, delete relations. Sure. We're going to delete all of our relations. Yeah. Okay. And then we're going to pick our whole sketch and fix it. Sure. It's it, it's like a in context assembly yep. part modeling. No no references made. That's right. And that's why you got to be careful when you do this not to sketch on this face, but to sketch on the plane. Because if you sketch on this face, that face is going to go away here in just a second, and then you're you yeah. Know, going to have another yeah. rebuild error for not being able to find the sketch. Oh, part. this is this is this is great. So just to recap, the last couple minutes. You know what? Uh, what Barry showed us is what he's calling a ghost sketch, which is the next station for his loft. The first one, the plane one, he was showing us using uh, intersect or uh, split uh, yeah. to create an intersection. That's great, but here he doesn't want to create any sharp edges, right? Just have those sketch entities. So, you know, a lot of I think under the hood SolidWorks model tinkering probably comes down to, to techniques like this. You know, this can be yeah. very handy to get the edges you need to then create. What one more station, or is this it for your loft? You need this to create will be, another. This, one? this will be it for this one. All right, let's see. Let's see the next step here. I know everyone's eager to see. Like, where do you yeah. where do you go from here? So once we get out of there, we now have this sketch using those edges that we just created with that surface cut. But now, if we delete that surface cut, 
our sketch is still there. Nice. Not dirty. And now we have our whole part back. Yep. Yep. So that's the next great. thing I wanted to show, you know, a lot of getting good and fast in SolidWorks is when you get errors that you understand what they mean and why you're getting them. So right here, if I wanted to create this uh, new rib, I could just loft it. Kind of clicking it in the same spot. So those, yes. those, uh, and I talked about that a little yeah, bit. The last one, I was going to say the tangency yeah. or the connection lines. Yep. yep. And we'll show it, show that again real quick. You know, back when I first started loft and I had no clue what was happening, I would just do like that. And it's like, what the, that is yep. not what I want at all. And then one day I accidentally drug this little control. That's right. Uh, all here. And it was like, oh, so, you know, I just got to make sure that they line up with each other. And that can be kind of tough if you have two sketches that have like a different number of sketch entities in them. But usually you'll be able to figure it out pretty, pretty easy. Now, look, sometimes in SOLIDWORKS, we design because we want to increase our standing in the workforce, right? Like with certification prep. And sometimes it's to get parts ready for documentation and machining, like we saw in Barry's episode just a moment ago. And sometimes we 3D model for completely different reasons, like, I don't know, making your own action figures. So if you're unfamiliar with next-gen cloud 3D modelers we've created here at SOLIDWORKS, like 3D Creator and 3D Sculptor, you will love what you're about to see from product experts Noah Zeef and Gian Khaleesi. Noah and Gian held a two-part episode earlier this year showcasing the design and 3D printing of a set of custom action figures, which we gave away, by the way, at the latest 3D Experience World event in tandem with a super donation to our friends over at Magic Wheelchair. So let's take a look at some of the most watched portions of Gian and Noah's live design appearances. So if I select that 3D shape that contains all of our OGSs, you'll see this is what's shown right now from our master model. This is the, this is the only part that's left shown. The arm itself that you still see there are the components that we just made. So those five components are what we just created. And now we can actually add some mates because they are their own components. So I'm just going to add a few here. I'm going to do a concentric between uh, the upper arm and the shoulder. And then I'm also going to make that coincident, those two flat faces. And really, that's that's all we need. We're just going to add a few more concentric and a few more coincident. The and, same type of mates from SOLIDWORKS? Yep, okay. same types of mates. Um, and they pop up just when you grab the, just when you start selecting faces. And I'm going to fast forwarding through adding all those other mates. Let's actually test out the motion. Oh, I also changed the colors of the components so we can <laughs> see them more easily. So oh, that, that is so cool. Yeah, that shows so nicely. And I remember this was especially useful when it came to manufacturing because without having to spend any resources in printing, um, we already knew how much this was going to move, or we had a general idea of how much it was going to move. Right. So yeah, really useful there. So we've got all that split into components. Our components are red, but our master model is still gray. It's just just for keeping it easy to follow along here. We have mates for our arms. What I actually want to do before I finish this whole assembly off and make everything its own component, what I actually want to do is, is uh, make changes to the master model. So we finished splitting it into components so that we can understand the motion and the efficacy of our assembly. Now we're going to change the master model, which we did a number of times. We did a lot of revisions. <laughs> yes. Back. A lot of changes. Most of it is uh, due to our perfectionism, probably. Right. But, yeah. So all self-imposed stress, but. Right. Yeah. Once we started it, we we had to go all the way. Yeah. You there's know? there's uh, once the head moved, the shoulder had to move. Oh, once that moved, his his elbow had to move. So yeah, we definitely took it all the way. Uh, but let's uh, so let's show what that actually looked like. Yeah. So changing the master model, jumping right back to where we just were. I'm gonna hide these components. Okay, and I'm gonna show the arm again for my master model. So once again, we're all gray, we're just showing our master model now. And I wanna make a change to it, to our original sub D body for that. So I'm gonna go into that sub D for the arm. And yeah, this guy, he's been slacking on, uh, on biceps a little bit, he's been doing too much shoulders. So we've, we're making his deltoids a little bit bigger and uh, he's been skimping on the curls. So we're actually gonna, we're gonna make his bicep a little bit smaller. What'd you say? He eats, he eats iron for breakfast? 
This guy just tough guy. He eats weights, but he's been slacking on the on the curls right now. So been too too much shoulder lifts or whatever. So we made some changes to the sub D driving this. Our master model has now been updated. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide this. Uh, I'm going to or sorry, I'm going to collapse that. I'm going to show our components overlaid on our master model and see how they're kind of uh, there's like gray red overlapping areas. Right. Yeah. So that's where the model is actually perfectly superimposed and perfectly overlapping is where you see a lot of that interference or the, the overlap. That's the master model, master model and the physical products, yep. right? That are superimposed on each yep. other. Overlapping okay. with each other. But the two points that we just uh, edited, the bicep and the shoulder, uh, they don't have overlap. And the reason is because now our master model is bigger in the shoulder area, so it's actually popping through the physical product. Mm -hmm. And our bicep we made smaller, so now we only see the, the physical product left, the red part, and uh, because the bicep in our master model has been made smaller and is now behind that surface. So the re I just wanted to show this so that you could see what is going to change and watch carefully as I'm about to now just go down to uh, solve this thing. So by solving this, this assembly, now you'll see we have perfect overlap once again. Gotcha. And our, uh, now our components are now up to date with our master model. And that's because you had external references turned on exactly. when you made those new components, right? So it would right. always look back to that master model. Exactly, exactly. If we didn't have ex external references on, then it would have just been like a copy of the body or of the part at just that one point in time, and there would have been no link. Um, mm -hmm. So we would have been just kind of stuck with what we had. But now we have the master model that has all the geometry we actually work on, and that actually drives everything in our components. Gotcha. I know you much more perfectionists. If you had to guess how many times uh, we went back, or how many times you went back when you were sculpting this, uh, at least at least a dozen, or maybe a couple dozen times yeah. that we would go back and whether it was a small change or a big change. There, were, I mean, I, I think I think it, did I mention already how we like we moved the whole knee up a little bit? Yeah, like, we moved the knee up. We moved. Uh, I think we made, made his torso. Yeah, his torso had to get yeah. smaller, and actually, I think shorter. I think it was too long at first. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, probably would have helped to have some type of reference in here, but I, right. I, it was a challenge. It was I was trying to challenge myself here and see what we could do. Cool. But that's our components up to date now. Um, we can hide that original part of our master model and just see the, our parts are up to date, our physical products, and we can replicate this process for all of the other components. So that the master model contains all the geometry, the assembly has all of our other parts in it that are driven by that. And by having it all made it up, we can we can test out the motion, like we were saying, for the assembly. Right. And we can also test out some different poses for this guy. I love that. So cool. All that's missing now is a simulation we could run on him, see how fast he can run, how much he could lift. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> let us know in the chat if you'd like to see, you know, any any cool simulations with, uh, with the X design or X-shape action figures. Yeah, be cool. we would love to do that. Uh, but that was the making the change to our master model. So quick changes there in our master model, drive changes in the assembly. So giving us that single point of, I, I want to say single point of truth, but that single point, uh, our master model being the only place that we have to go to actually make edits to the geometry. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, anything with mates is all within the assembly. But that's, uh, that's just about it. So just to recap, we set up a master model. We used OGSs so that we could organize it and work on it efficiently. And then I showed how we sculpted some of the surfaces by just doing that whole arm from start to finish. Mm -hmm. We added some parametric details, punched a few holes through it, did a few revolves. Then we split it into individual components so we could understand the motion of that assembly. And then we finally made some changes to our master model, showed how those changes propagate into our assembly, and then we fast forwarded to the end where we had replicated all those steps and finally have like a complete master model and working assembly of this action figure. Awesome, looks so cool. And the product came out so great, I'd say. Um, 
And we did this uh, not just for X design too. We did this for X shape as well. Yep. Yeah, he's he's on the desk as well. Yep. And I, and I almost think he was kind of a bit simpler too because X design he had like those pockets, he had the knee pads. Yep. Um, and his logo had different colors too, so we had to incorporate different parts. So I would say X shape was in a way almost easier, right? Yeah, X shape was definitely easier, and not even just because of that, but we were also able to to make X shape. We just made a copy of the X design guy. And I just like made him a little bit less muscular, <laughs> a little bit less. Just took like, him out of the gym. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But his his hair too, I thought that was really cool because, you know, you could do a lot with subdivision. Yeah. But obviously sculpting like hair, like thin features, those would have been impossible to manufacture. Yes. So you had to really keep manufacturing in mind when you sculpted the hair of, say, X shape. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. And I mean, you saw the result, like it's. It's obviously it's it doesn't look like perfect hair like yeah. it's not like we just right. put a wig on the guy but right. it's action figure exactly uh, worthy. exactly it's, figure. it looks like plastic hair I mean he's mm -hmm. got kind of a weird hairstyle like it looks like he just went through a wind tunnel or something right <laughs> or he's just using way too much product but no they look great and let's see we're actually at the top of the hour so again these are our two core two core apps X design with parametric. X shape with subdivision modeling. And yep. if you guys want these models, they're available to you right now for free. Um, you go to solveworks.com slash action figure model. And there you could get the 3D XML, which has all these subdivisions that you sculpted. Yep. So you can mess around with those and have some fun. You can make them look like you hit the gym even more and <laughs> make them even bigger. Or you could go to solveworks.com slash action figure STL and you could actually download the STLs that are ready to go on a 3D printer. You can fire those up right away. You know, as kids, most of us, I think, played with action figures and trucks. You know, who, who didn't play with trucks? I, I bet most of you in the chat today probably did. But then some of us, we grew up to design functioning, high-performing, custom emergency vehicles, just like Sean, Luz, and the team over at PL Custom. So PL Custom took the live design stage earlier this year to review how they've used both SolidWorks 3D CAD and SOLIDWORKS Electrical to design and configure custom emergency vehicles on both the mechanical and electrical fronts. Let's take a look at that episode. The lighting will come up into controls into the rear switch panels back here. And then they also have a set of cab controls up here in the front. And that is where we are basically starting the electrical design. That's where we're starting to implement SOLIDWORKS Electrical is up here at the front of the cab in the console. But uh, yeah, let's take a look at what you have here on the electrical schematics or harnessing. Well, it's like. <laughs> so this is kind of inside, you know, from the console. This is already mm -hmm. right here and we have uh, the switch panel with certain components. I, of course, didn't put everything that goes there, but the main components are here. We have uh, like a three main harnesses and for the entire ambulance, we use five main harnesses. They connect everything around you. So how many parts and lights Sean was showing in the entire truck. Um, at this moment, I'm just concentrated in the, in the console, but uh, right here, we use a 45 connector for everything. And then uh, for, the, for the five main uh, harnesses. So I just did one, the, the EC one, uh, wow. and you can see here the, the side that is connected to the console is the two connectors and the main switch harness, this connector that goes to the electrical cabinet that has 45 pins. And um, I have to say SolidWorks Electrical really helped us with this because after you put the... Um, you know what? Let me show you straight in the in the, in the SolidWorks Electrical. So okay. Can see. Sure. So it's so, okay. So here, this is an entire truck. I don't know. You can see the menu is. Uh, we create this is like a template for one kind of ambulance that we're working on. It is called F series, and uh, we create a template with a every single drawing that will be needed for uh, like a basic uh, 
uh, drawings, the um, schematics that are needed in every truck for this kind of ambulance. So mm -hmm. this package that you see is very big. <laughs> Is a lot of drawings and uh, oh, but wow. every, yeah, you is. know for the sirens you need one for the front flashing lights you need another one for the air condition you need another one and on and on and on. Um, sometimes you see an ambulance passing through and then you just see a few lights uh, flashing and you hear the siren and you don't even know there could be like a three hundred and something like fifty tons that you can set in your siren. And you just hear some tons, you know, always you pretty much hear the same thing. So it's, it's kind of neat to know this. So um, so this is my template um, that we're trying to implement. So anytime we get a new truck, I'm going to just run this. I created like a new. If I send create new, this is what they are going to start with. So it's pretty it's a lot of work safe for, for you know, a new job. So in case that we need, um, the customer don't want uh, six lights inside the truck, but he wants 10 lights. So we just have to come here and look for the dawn lights and delete the, um, uh, all right here. Delete this um, schematic and then replace it. We create, um, I don't think I can open it here because but this is no, um, the base, uh, the solid electrical, but we have in our library has created macros. So all these um, schematics, each one of this is being created in um, a library that is uh, mm -hmm. the macro library. So each one we can go and access and replace or get it just, just going to the main book and say insert project um Macro and then here we will have the. Um, let me see. You can see here some some of the ones that we have. So like the ten lights. See this one. This light look cool. So this is an air horn. So if I want to um, put it in, I just have to find it. And that also is very easy to find if you don't know the number of the drawing or all the name specific. You can just go in the filters description type what are you looking for and the software will find it for you and give you the choices. So it's very easy to to add to my main job. So I'm saving time, you know, used to, before used to be a little bit more work to get something in my book to get all this truck ready to go. Wow. This is, this is like incredibly sophisticated. I'm, I, Honestly, I didn't expect to see this level of sophistication because I think Sean said that you guys got started with SolidWorks Electrical not too long ago, right? Yeah, um, I've been really, really like a year ago. So a year ago, wow. Okay, yeah. I mean, I yeah, that's that's incredible. I mean, you have these these templates for each of your vehicles, and then you know for any adjustments you need to make, you have like these macros. I don't know much about SolidWorks Electrical, so I'm learning a lot today as well. But you know that's uh, that's pretty unbelievable. You guys have become very sophisticated with it very very quickly. Is that is that pretty typical? You think that that companies can get to this level of sophistication on this tool um, um, like that quickly? Well, that quickly? you have to invest time and learn because the software is a big uh, machine that gives you so many tools. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes it's intimidating because um, even just to to create a symbol. You know, you you we are seeing this symbol right here, mm -hmm. but what the machine see? I don't know. Let me see if the machine would let me up. This is what the machine see. Okay. It's totally okay. different. You know, like a wow. What is all those signs and links and and which one belong to what? So in order for me to get the description or location, I have to has the link here. So so take time to learn. But after you know. Uh, nobody has to go to that symbol, you know, you, you learn how to set the symbol right, you just drop it there, and um, and then you, when you drop the symbol that you know you need, um, the software will open this window, and here you pretty much put anything you need, or all you're going to need for any kind of report in the future is here. So the location, what is going to be, um, the name, you know, how you're going to call this, what is specific, because like you see here, I have two USBs. 
So, mm -hmm. you know, here you can be more uh, described better anything you want for the customer. So um, another cool thing about macros, and now I just remember with this one, say um, you want this is going to be used all the time. You know, like you don't know how many USBs your customer wants. So you just can drop it in the macros, say USB. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this L Luz Elena USB. <laughs> just to put it a name. So I just, um, I'm creating a macro. And then now, I, I lost it here. Just one second. You know, see, okay, sorry. <laughs> so I have it here, and from now on, I can add as much as UBs already um, with the connector with manufacturing information ready. And the, the USB also will have the, the main information that I already put there. So this is very neat because it's super easy, you know, you can add whatever number of parts you want and you're saving time you don't have to go and put the characteristics on the you know maybe change the name and that's it you know each episode that we featured so far has uniquely highlighted different ways of both geometry making and production and our last featured episode of solaris live design from 2023 so far that is is really no different so Andrew Lowe appeared on SolidWorks Live Design recently, producing one of the most viewed episodes of the year as he showed off particular considerations and methods to adding fillets and blends to his parts and assemblies. So the designs that Andrew gave us a peek into were produced in his capacity as design director at industrial design firm Cortex Design. Let's check out one of the most viewed snippets of this episode, which was hosted, by the way, by Steve Fick. Likewise, you know, this is a, this is a product for detecting uh, certain kinds of infection after certain kinds of uh, surgery when the patient is still recovering at the hospital. And because this device is being worn on them and the patient's in bed, we wanted to have a very smooth uh, sculpted, almost pebble-like appearance. So that way the device was very soft if you were you know, sleeping and you accidentally rolled over and it was, was underneath you. We didn't want that to you know, have hard edges. And so this was an example where everything was of the, you know, the G3 uh, connection. And we had that very smooth uh, sculpted, almost like a, you know, a pebble that you find on the beach that's been worn smooth by the, the nature of the tides over time. Got it. Got it. So maybe you're going to take us here next, but how do you, how do you go about so we looked at kind of those that 2D profile example, but how do you go about achieving this in like three dimensions where, you know, like I've got kind of that, would you, you know, the teddy bear example or a, or a corner that's coming together? Oh, well, I'm glad that you asked, Steve, because uh, I've actually got a baked out example that we can, uh, oh, we can run through. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, I'll just, uh, I'll jump to the end here. Uh, actually, no, let me jump into SolidWorks. I think it'll be a little bit faster. And let's bring up the completed model. And I want to, uh, this is something that's more than just a, you know, a corner. I do want to have uh, you know, a little bit more you know, geometry, a little bit more nuance to the shape. Yeah, while you're bringing that up, if you have, again, if you guys have questions about this, by all means, okay. add them to the chat. Andrew, I think you're getting a couple suggestions for maybe a couple YouTube videos about modeling uh, modeling a Definitely. coffee mug handle and, and whatnot. Make a video so. on the handle profile of a coffee mug. Yeah, that's an interesting example of, you know, want to have that, that handle blend out nicely, you know, for yeah. that slip cast uh, ceramic. Uh, we're just going to hide the cameras. Cool. And I think we're going to turn off perspective because it's going to jump around. Uh, so this was just a little imaginary device that I had whipped up for presentation this year at uh, Three Experience World. Uh, you know, it could be anything. You know, but uh, one of the hallmarks of this design uh, was that we were going to incorporate a uh, rounded LCD display. Um, you know, rather than having something square, perhaps the particular functionality and user interface that was determined, you know, it made sense to have it round for whatever reason. But that's the nice thing when you're just imagining shapes is you don't really have to justify the function and uh, and justify what it's actually designed to do. Sure. 
Um, but this example brings up a couple interesting uh, tidbits, and that also plays into the use of the style spline and now in later versions of SOLIDWORKS, the G3 torsion continuity uh, relation. So I have a very simple layout sketch and I have a slot entity and then I have a callout for the raised portion where I'm going to have my display. I don't want to have it on the same flat face as the model. I would like to elevate the display from a styles perspective so that way it's a little bit more prominent, uh, a little bit clearer to the user. Uh, but if we were to look at our curvature of a slot, once again, I have this very abrupt transition and mm -hmm. I want to smooth that out. And so I need to create a, a bit of a transition where I have a portion here that's being replicated by a style spline rather than it being an arc. Uh, and so in the same way that I had used the uh, fillet tool at the sketch level to call out a larger transition, here I have some lines being used to split out uh, a little area that I'll replace with my G3 connection. And I'm just using some, uh, some angles here to, to fully constrain these lines. Okay. So I, I have my splits. So I'm just calling that this is the little area that I need to create my, my G3 transition. Uh, and I'm jumping in here. And there's a couple ways I can go about doing this. I can manually eyeball it here. So I can kind of you know drag this to where it's almost at the point that my style spline works. But if we were to start from scratch, what I'd like to do for this perfect transition is style spline. And I know I need degree six because I have my three control segments each direction. So I could even create this and go up to six. So I'm going to set the first bits to be equal. And in the second portion, I'm also going to set them to be equal. And with this example, I can set them to be collinear. And I'll need to just before I do this, I find it prudent to kind of drag the shape to almost where you want it to be. There's sure. a tendency to uh, not over constrain itself. And then I can set the torsion continuity. And because I had set all those segments to be equal to each other, it's now fully constrained. So I don't have to worry about those oh, points nice. moving in space. I have a fully black style spline. Yeah. Uh, question in chat, how did I side upon the angles uh, experience? Um, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you want a little bit more. I just kind of play around with the angles and that's why I like having this driven parametrically so I can you know, turn on my style spline and, uh, and have that, that very gradual transition. Got it. So I now have that smooth transition that I can use uh, to create uh, some model geometry. And this is gonna disagree with me because I deleted uh, in the sake of the examples, we'll just reload so I don't have the uh, the dangling sketch. And we'll run back up in the tree and turn off that camera. So it's running back, and I'll turn on model edges so it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, I'm starting with a solid, right? Rather than starting with surfaces, I get more features all at once. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I started with a solid is I wanted to do a cutback. So there's going in, in industrial design, we kind of call this a pillow top or a crown top, but you'll see it in a lot of uh, electro or consumer electronics, medical devices, et cetera, et cetera. It's that hallmark shape on the top of a laptop where you have a very flat shape and then it looks like it, it tapers off on the edges. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and in order to do that, I need to get some new model edges. Um, and I'm accomplishing that with a cut. And actually I'm accomplishing that with a cut with a thin feature. So I'm just using this to, to create some new edges. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're surface modeling, you're, you're more worried about the edges and the faces. Uh, you know, Solid modeling, you care about the overall shape. Um, but solid modeling is a great way of getting you faces, getting you edges to be able to uh, you know, work with the, uh, with the geometry. Uh, one thing I do want to call out, though, uh, is that depending on how, uh, you know, so actually this is converted, is the way that SOLIDWORKS is handling offsets. 
So this is an example where I've offset everything and I'm showing mm -hmm. the curvature comb. So I have this 12 millimeter offset dimension. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't handle the offset of splines the best. You can actually see that there's this weird kind of like taper in the curvature. Sure. Um, and so when you're doing this kind of final and, and actually in an example, uh, you know, the, the, the larger the radius, the tighter this actually gets. So if I set this to say 18, you can see that that, that issue is oh, exaggerating yeah. itself. The sh the sh it's starting to get very sharp in this corner. You can almost see that with, uh, with shells. You know, so using the shell feature with curvature continuous geometry, those, mm -hmm. uh, those radii get super tight. Uh, we just do a quick example of that to help demonstrate this phenomenon. So if I had a block here and I radius the corner, maybe 25 to really show this off, I'm going to go curvature continuous. And then let's shell this part with a 10 millimeter wall. I'm going to pick these faces because we want them to go away. You know, my corner starts getting very, very sharp. And, and this exaggerates uh, the bigger the, the shell is and the bigger the offset. So in this, you know, it's almost perfectly sharp there. And the shell right. tools actually split this into two faces. Uh, it's just the way that SolidWorks handles the, uh, the offsets. Uh, but you can work around. It's a little bit more uh, work, but it just means in this sketch example, uh, what I've done is created my own. I just used the offset tool to get me the arc mm -hmm. and the line because that's mathematically offsets perfectly. Uh, and then I've created a new uh, style spline here. And if I wanted to link these parametrically a little bit more, I could actually pick the control segments one by one. So I could pick this one and I could pick this one and I could go along and I could make them all parallel to each other. All right, everyone. Thank you to our production team and all of our live design hosts and guests so far this year. To keep up with SolidWorks live design throughout the year, visit SolidWorks on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and sign up for notifications. Next up on our live calendar, for me at least, well, the most wonderful time of the year is here. It's SolidWorks launch. What's new 2024? The season is upon us. So our team's been putting together tons of demos to help you study up and level up with SolidWorks 2024. And we'll be back on SolidWorks Live very soon at any special date and time, so mark this down. It is Wednesday, September 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern. So you can visit YouTube today to set up a notification for this episode where you will assuredly receive jam-packed looks at the best of what's new in parts, assemblies, drawings, and much, much more. Thank you to everyone out there. Thank you to all of you on YouTube, LinkedIn, and everywhere else that you are tuning in. Until next time, take care.